The cyberspace is home to billions of people and is the right platform you need to grow your business. Financially, will be brought out in this interview. I thank you. I think whoever is going to talk after the mayor will have a serious challenge. He was talking, speaking after uh, the mayor has spoken with eloquence. One cannot master. I think it will be very difficult and challenging. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I think for that great speech, uh, which sets the tone for the deliberations, the narratives, the discourses for today. I think lastly, part of what he has said will be dependent on the political will and commitment. Hence, the presence, I think, of our government officials today. And we are hoping that we are going to rely on them to be able to mobilize the political will at higher levels that we need uh, in order to implement uh, the deliberations, the recommendations that we are going to come out with. Uh, at this moment I will welcome Florence Dovo to talk about the introductions and briefly introduce participants, expectations and workshop objectives. Uh, over to you. There's a discussion paper by the Inter-Ministerial Ministerial Task Force a review of alignment of AMA public finance management laws. So, we want to see the opportunity or a forum for citizens to also input to that process. What do you think about AMA public finance management laws? Let's interrogate them further. We hope this discussion will input to that. And then, um, over the Chelsea, any of the lagging and my expectations, but I'm not expecting the world. I'm not going to get to the world. I'm not going to get to the world. And the organization that you have. And your expectations. So it goes to the hour of 10 and shooting to the big 100 point to the FX. So you pull on Lula, you pull on Brexit right Show on a big Friday.
Good morning to you all. Uh, my name is Tyson Tonorim Chawai. Uh, 
IEM, the Regional Finance and Administration Manager, uh, Zimbabwe Revenue Authority. I'm based at Mishashangel. Uh, I'm here representing the Regional Manager, Domestic Taxes, Mr. L.P. Due, who is uh, on, 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 on another assignment. Um, I, I have had um, the representation from the legislature, uh, the, the local authorities, which is, is, is worship the mayor, um, the other interested uh, uh, parties who, are, who contribute immensely to, 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 to the fiscals. Um, I, I take this opportunity to be an, an interactive uh, process. Zimra is a mandate to collect revenue on behalf of, of government and it contributes uh, about 90% of, of, of the funds which, which are then allocated by, uh, by the minister and approved by the by the by the legislature, um, my expectation is to say, as we interact, we will pick the, the issues that we should address, and uh, which I, I should cascade, so that we will continue to to also advise the government, which is through the Ministry of Finance. aspect and the transparency aspect. But those two aspects don't only relate to systems that are there uh, which, which need strengthening. They also, need, they also relate to, to us as the citizen. Uh, what is our, our role as the citizen in terms of uh, making sure that these, these systems are transparent, these systems are accountable. And what is our role also as, as the citizen in terms of how we can contribute towards the, the, the transparency and the, the, uh, the strengthening of, uh, of those systems. So those are, those are my expectations for today. Thank you. 
Moyo, Councillor for World 17. I'm also here to understand what is public finance and how the public can understand it better. Guidance of our councillors will never happen. 
with a scenario where the mayor will not mention this. Allocated a piece of land against a staggering housing waiting for 15,000. Allocated a, a, a piece of land to his three year old son and claimed that the son was self employed. Uh, somewhere in Unit C, to the stand was never shot to one kind of mission. The audit was able to expose. But normally these things are exposed after the money. The point is that Zinara recently we had. CEO Sinara was not simply to one of the main uh, chief accounts, uh, one of the accounts, the uh, Sinara accounts, whereby only two staff members knew about that account were signatories. And this was discovered after a lot of money and what? It leaked out. So we hope that we'll be able to plug uh, those hemorrhages fiscal uh, and ensure that there be fiscal discipline. At this stage, I would like to welcome John Marketo, who uh, will give us a brief highlight in terms of overview of the public finance management uh, principles. Thank you, John. Thank you very much, uh, Emmanuel. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm um, happy to be here. And we would like also to acknowledge uh, those that have spoken before me, uh, our honorable members of parliament. Um, thank you so much for coming to this uh, interval. Our councillors uh, and other leaders from our, our various sectors, members of um, uh, representing various government departments. Uh, would like to thank you so much for coming to this meeting. Uh, I, I, I was listening. I understand Home Affairs is here. That means our law enforcement is well represented. Uh, the education is here which constitutes one of the largest public, uh, uh, public sector <laughs> enterprises. Uh, I also uh, Zimra, the revenue collectors, and uh, which one other one did I hear? Uh, Emma, yes, Emma, uh, the environment, uh, Zesa, one of uh, the, uh, the, the critical power status that we have uh, in this great country. Ladies and gentlemen, um, my, my presentation uh, is not exhaustive, but it's only to, to guide us, to, to give us an, um, um, uh, a way forward. It's meant to also underpin our discussions on certain uh, principles that we want to adhere to, uh, is that we want to refer to as we discuss uh, issues of uh, public finance management. So I was saying uh, in this other meeting that as we talk about public finance management, we need to be uh, first and foremost very clear what we are talking about, who we are referring to as public who we are referring to uh, as uh, uh, private. That distinction must be very clear between public funds and private funds. But where do we draw the line? And uh, the management aspect of it. So, uh, from the introductions given here, the expectations, I think it is very clear. People are very clear of, uh, of this concept. Um, of public finance management. But uh, for the avoidance of doubt, public finance refer to resources put or collected from uh, the citizen. This is a pool of funds that we contribute as, uh, as, as citizens in various platforms. Um, if you are a taxpayer, you have you are a shareholder in this country's public base. 
Uh, and uh, we need to be cognizant of the fact that we pay taxes in various forms, directly or indirectly, knowingly and unknowingly, we, we, we contribute to the national pace. When you buy your sugar, when you buy your bread, you, you, a percentage of your uh, hard end money goes to the national pace. When you cross the border with some goodies uh, and you pay some duty at the border there, some of your money is uh, collected and goes to the national pace. And um, uh, recently the system has been upgraded to ensure that even when you are uh, uh, paying your school fees, when you are making any, transact any transaction, you are sending money to somebody electronically and so forth. E e e e e the system has made sure that you, you also contribute in order to collect, you uh, to benefit from these sums of money that we're moving uh, in, in the airwaves. Because uh, at some point, money has not been exchanging hands, but uh, moving electronically. So the system has been upgraded to make sure that uh, even in that system, you also contribute. Uh, I'm talking about the 2% tax, transaction tax. So whichever way, we, we, we are contributors to the national pace. This is what makes us stakeholders in this great endow. So everybody becomes uh, a concerned stakeholder. Why? Because if you contribute to the uh, basket that we are talking about, then we must also uh, be concerned about how that basket is utilized, how it's shared, how it's reallocated, how it's distributed to everyone else. This is why we are here, ladies and gentlemen, because we want to see what is inside the basket. We want to see um, how it's being distributed and why it's always empty, yet we are always uh, contributing. Why we are always having to borrow and ask for more from others when we are always putting something in that basket on a daily basis. You see, this, this, this is, these are the questions that probes this kind of gathering. To, we want to interrogate those issues and to guide us. Everything that we are doing is being done under the auspices of the law. Our great nation has got a constitution. Thank God we, 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 we did away with the Lancaster's constitution. Lest we are going to say we did not, um, we did not play a, any role in that. But in 2013, we engaged in a process of crafting a new constitution. That was made reference to by uh, his worship, the mayor. And then, after the constitution was crafted, there are pieces of legislation which includes the Public Finance Management Act and other acts of parliament, which then specifically guides how um, the public finance management system should operate in Zimbabwe. And so that is our mainstay as we discuss issues to do with public finance management in Zimbabwe. And uh, we, we need to be cognizant of the supremacy of the constitution. Uh, so what that simply means is that uh, anything that contravenes what the constitution provides for is illegal. So we may have a, a very good PFM Act, but if it goes against what the constitution provides for, it's an illegal piece of act. Hence the justification for the realignment. This is why not only the PFM Act, but a number of uh, pieces of legislation, as the pro president pronounced at the beginning of this ninth uh, session of, of parliament, that a number of uh, pieces of legislation will be tabled in parliament as bills so that they are aligned to the con constitution. And I'm glad that our government is aware that we've got a number of illegal pieces of legislation which must conform to the what? To the constitution of the country. Because the constitution is the supreme law of the country. So here we are confining our discussions specifically 
to the Public Finance Management Act. And we are saying that there are gaps within that act which are, um, co which are speaking contrary to what the Constitution provides for. And um, these are the issues that we have invited experts here who are going to speak after me to point to us certain sections of that piece of legislation which they are recommending uh, and even yourselves as delegates to this endeavor. We will want to come out of this meeting with a recommendation to say these are the issues we want aligned to the Constitution. These are the issues we want strengthened in um, uh, the Public Finance Management Act in order to close uh, leakages, to minimize uh, uh, losses from this basket that I was talking about. Lest we continue to put resources in there and they continue to leak and we will never find anything there. All right. So, like I said, the review is there to identify gaps and recommend amendments. Now, we are in the middle of a process that has already started. Unfortunately, uh, in our country, there is a system which always relegates citizens to the very last when things are already happening. We are aware that there is a, in place an inter-ministerial technical committee that has been put in place in order to um, look at the alignment of this piece of legislation. Also, particularly the Public Finance Management Act. I know that the IMT has uh, produced a discussion paper which they have already submitted and proposed for discussion with recommendations on areas that must be uh, realigned. That's, so, the Inter-Ministerial Technical Committee already, we can say that the cabinet or the executive is already covered. They have put forward their submissions. The parliament, I am also aware that through the budget office, the, the, the portfolio committee on um, uh, budget, finance, and economic development, they have already put forward their recommendations on areas which they feel need to be strengthened or need to be aligned to the Constitution in order to strengthen the Public Finance Management Act. So we already have the voice from Parliament, we have the voice from the Executive, but something is missing. The citizens' voice is missing. And this is why Zimcode has convened us. We need to have the voice of the citizens contributing also to the alignment process of the um, PFM Act to the Constitution. So we need to discuss this um, uh, in this meeting with that level of seriousness to say that we want our voices to be heard in this process because we are, like I said in the, in, in the beginning, we are the bigger players, we are the stakeholders in the public finance management system of Zimbabwe. Right. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll go straight away to just highlight um, uh, some of the guiding principles which are in, which are provided for, which are provided for in the in, in the constitution, which must then uh, govern how how the, the the PFM system should be should be run, and these are the issues uh, copied. Uh, word for word from the Constitution. That's what our Constitution says. That's what our Constitution says. Chapter 17 of our Constitution um, directly speaks to these issues. These are the principles that should guide the public finance management system. So there are issues that I want to speak to. Number one, as a principle, every practice in public finance management should be done in a transparent and accountable manner. I am glad people have already made the reference to these issues. But we must be very worried that we may have some buzzwords which we just speak about rhetorically and they are never practiced. Everywhere you go, everywhere you, you, you get to meetings, people are talking about transparency, people are talking about accountability. But how do we get to practice transparency, to practice accountability? Transparency is when every citizen has got access to critical information regard uh, public finance management. You need to know if you are going to, to South Africa to buy a vehicle, you must be able to go to, to probably, as an example, to Zimra website and access and, 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 and find out 
how much you are going to be paying for what type of a vehicle. With, equipped with that information, nobody can bribe you to say, no, let me work out this for you so that your duty will be reduced. Because you are already informed, you are equipped, you are empowered with information. That's the level of transparency that we need. You need to know that how much rates should you be paying at the local authorities. You need to be knowing what the council is collecting on a monthly basis. That should be public information. It should be very clear. When information is not um, uh, disseminated to citizens, it creates room for, for, for corruption, for fraud, for bribery, because people are in the dark. We just need to lay bare everything so that people do what is right and what is lawful. And accountability speaks then to issues of answerability, responsiveness, and, and taking um, responsibility for wrong or right actions. We need people who will stand up one day. I'm looking for that day when we are going to have one minister in this country who stands up to say, because of what has happened in my ministry, I'm too ashamed. I'm resigning. That's a level of accountability. We need to see councillors to say, no, 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 no. This is too shameful. I am too embarrassed by what has happened in the council that I'm working in. I am resigning on basis of ethics. I am resigning on basis of integrity. That's the level of accountability that we must look forward to. And then, number two, public finance system must be directed towards national development. And in particular, uh, hear me well, ladies and gentlemen, when we're saying national development, national development does not mean private or personal development. I come from Rogok, a remote place down there, where we travel four, five hours for a distance of 60 kilometers because of bad roads. But in our area, we are, we, are, we are one of the largest producers of cotton in this country, which is a forex area. But there are areas in this country where people drive to their doorstep in a third road. Those imbalances must be addressed through national development. So our resources must be directed towards the national development, not personal or private development. I'll take a breather. As the Honorable Deputy Minister walks in uh, uh, to take his seat, um, otherwise, how are we doing? How are we doing? How am I doing so far? <laughs> are, we, are, we, are we flowing together? Yes. Th thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, Honorable, welcome. Thank you so much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we, we uh, would like to welcome our, our, one of our guests, uh, the Honorable Deputy uh, Minister uh, in the Ministry of uh, Industry and Commerce, uh, Honorable Modi. Thank you for um, accepting our invitation and, and coming to this meeting. Uh, we, we, we value and uh, we are honored to have you here today. Uh, thank you so much. We may give a, a round of applause for our minister. Thank you. Um, so as you're working here, I'm speaking to some of the guiding principles that are governing, uh, that guide uh, Public Finance Management Act in Zimbabwe in order to guide and direct our discussions today. And um, the underpinning issues of uh, directing national resources towards national development are some of those issues bulleted there where I say uh, burden of taxation must be shared fairly. So there shouldn't be a section of the population which feels is heavily burdened by the taxation system more than others. It should, the burden should be shared fairly across the board and it should be done in an equitable manner which ensures that those that earn more, uh, uh, they pay more. And those that earn less, they pay less. The taxation system must be redistributed, in other words. It must be progressive, 
we, we are advocating for a taxation system that is people-centered, a taxation system that redistributes resources from those that, are, that have more than they need to those that do not have at all. And then revenue raised nationally must be shared equitably between the central government, provincial, and local tiers of government. I, I'm happy to see that bullet number two retained in the Public Finance Management Act. I am happy to see it retained for the reason that we are heading towards devolution. And I would love that to be retained and even strengthened or explained further in the Public Finance Management Act. Because we are now talking about issues of uh, sharing equitably resources uh, between central government. We are saying what central government is, is put together, even the, at provincial tiers of government. People should benefit at local government, tiers of government. Uh, uh, resources must be shared equitably. And then expenditure must be directed towards the development of Zimbabwe. I have spoken about that. And special provision must be made for marginalized groups and areas. We need to see this provision in our PFM system to ensure that those social groups which were previously marginalized are equipped they are promoted so that they catch up with others. If our taxation system is blind of the fact that women were previously marginalized, is blind of the fact that there are disability groups, is blind of the fact that there are ch children from less privileged families, that there are child-dead families, then our public finance management system has failed to, um, uh, to meet the standards provided for in that section of the Constitution, which say, suggests that there must be special provision um, uh, made for marginalized groups and areas. There are areas, like I said earlier on, which were previously marginalized. And there must be special provision, even in allocation of resources, to ensure that those areas, they catch up with the rest of the, what, of the country, even in the uh, Sustainable Development Goals which Zimbabwe has ratified, SDG number 11, leaving no one behind. Huh? No one must be left behind. So we must have that encrafted in our public finance management uh, act to ensure that nobody is left behind. On C, we have the burdens and the benefits of resources uh, which must be shared equitably between current and future generations. This idea of squandering all resources today and forgetting about those who are to come tomorrow is not sustainable at all. It, we must safeguard against such attitude and such behavior um, at all levels, at all levels, uh, in the public sector, private sector, uh, through enacting it in the Public Finance Management Act. Public funds must be expended transparently prudently and economically and effectively. Uh, I have spoken to this as well. We must make sure that whatever we do in our spending, in our allocation of resources, there must be reason to justify that this is economic. We must, this also speaks to issues of prioritization. Somebody said to me, at this point, Honorable Deputy Minister and others, our Honorable Members of Parliament, do we need to dualize Arari Blawai Road when we've got some areas of the country which are not accessible at all? It's good to be done, but is it a priority now? That's issues of being economic and efficient. If economic and efficient use of resources, you need to prioritize. We need to buy vehicles for all our executive members of government, executive members of local authorities, yes, but is it a priority now when we do not have drinking water, safe drinking water? So it's an issue of prioritization. It's an issue of prioritization, economic and efficient of use of resources. Public borrowing. And all transactions involving the national debt must be carried out transparently and in the best interest of Zimbabwe. 
debt, 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 debt. Zimbabwe is settled with a debt of over 18 billion now. And I understand further that the 18 billion, there is a huge domestic debt which is coming. I was reading in the paper. Uh, there is the issue of compensation of former white farmers. That's a domestic debt that is coming. And it's not in our books currently. If you hear of the figure of the current domestic debt, that debt is not coming. Whether there's going to be a payment plan, whether the, 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 the other time I read that the, the plan was to come up, the, the demand from commercial farmers was around 9 billion. So you need in your books to add a further 9 billion to the current debt because it's going to come in and, and, and increase the, the domestic debt that we have. So, how do we arrive at this kind of sustainable debt? When the Constitution clearly provides that all borrowings, all transactions, must be kept out transparently in the investing rate of Zimbabwe. And it provides for that Parliament must approve every such borrowing. How do we get to exceed the statutory limit of 70% of GDP? When we propose a constitutional provision, we set the limit. How do we get to see our reserve bank borrowing more than it should? or lending more than it should. When the, 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 the Act clearly says that it should not exceed 30% of previous year's revenue, how do we get to that? So we need then uh, to strengthen the, the legislation to ensure that, number one, it is punitive enough, it is restrictive, the, 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 the costs of violating the legislation must be higher, must be higher than the um, uh, the tendency of violating the motivation must be discouraged by the cost of violating it and this must be done through uh, this process of aligning the act to the of aligning the act to the um, constitution of Zimbabwe ladies and gentlemen like I said my presentation is not exhaustive it's not conclusive I was only stimulating the debate, throwing this to you. This is what our constitution provides and what is currently standing. What should we be aiming for? But we have today in the House uh, presenters who have invited experts, members of parliament, and also uh, we are uh, honored to have the Deputy Minister himself to be sharing with us as well his views on how we can strengthen the Public Finance Management Act uh, going forward. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. I hand over to you. Thank you so much, John, for I think that invigorating the presentation it triggered a lot of thinking. Uh, once more, welcome Deputy Minister and the MP for Pumola. For sorry. Bulawayo South. I almost said it's in the South. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we'll have an opportunity later on to hear from you. Uh, I think you all agree with me that we are in a state of what others have called a state of disequilibrium. You know, we are in a paradox. We are so flooded with information, but starved of knowledge. We are at an age where we have so many friends on, on Facebook, but being the loneliest person. So much information, you've quantity crowding out quality. We have so much food, but we are the least healthiest. Doesn't necessarily mean that the one who eats, you know, a lot of food is the healthiest. The food might lack essential nutrients. I think we'll all agree. Uh, I think the, pre the presentation provoked a lot, especially on my part, when we were talking about the sharing of public resources. You know, we always talk about the sharing of the national cake. It has been shared since 1980, we've been sharing this cake. Uh, I think we will need to take stock at some point to say uh, how much of it is left 
if any. Uh, I, I come from the back of beyond, some God forsaken place. Uh, that's St. Joseph's. You're talking about uh, some distances. For example, that kids travel to school. I was reminded of my story. You know, I was doing 17 kilometers to secondary school and 17 back. So it means in four years, I did 33,000 kilometers just to obtain an O-level certificate. I'm not going to say it's a useless certificate because I think it did not be no fit. Maybe I wouldn't be standing here. But what am I saying? I remember by the time I wrote, I said for my O levels. When I started Form 1, I was doing 11 subjects. But the date I said for my exams, I, I was left with five subjects. So it means had the exam delayed, I think a month later, I, I would have said for four. Because I was constantly dropping. Ah, there's no motivation. And why should I go to school? You know, but despite those hesitations, that I think we have faced all of us, uh, people still soldier on. But the, the bottom, the underlying principle, I think, is on resource, resource sharing. We have other areas where you have secondary schools in every five kilometers. So as we are going to be debating, interrogating this narrative of public resource sharing, what are some of the underlying key drivers? Uh, maybe for the inequitable sharing of resources, he was talking about minimizing losses. And that the voice of the citizen is missing in this narrative, in this discourse. I think this, is, for me, is an alternative, neutral platform where all of us can converge and then discuss. And then it says, it says, it should be clear how much council is collecting. That knowledge should be on the public domain. You know, we know Blower City Council would collect, I think I, I, now we must be on average between 10, 11 million, I don't know how much, but last time I checked, we were around 7 million a month. And we have come out to say, OK, there's a, a, a program that city council set the 3% retention. So we've said we are requesting for council to at least give us information on the 3%. We have not made noise about the other 97% where it is going. But I believe we, we have councillors here today who are going to help us and also shape the narrative, the discourse, give us the information that we are this knowledge that we are starved of. Uh, you are saying the public finance systems must be directed towards national development, address imp imbalances through national development. I know my later on will talk, he like talking about what we call that devolution under the material and competence. It's called what? What kind of a devolution is that? Co compensatory development. I think it would be interesting to, I think to hear the, the paradigms of opinions regarding uh, the issue of compensatory development. We are saying when others were developing, there were some re regions whose development was critically held back. Perhaps it is time to say, why don't we start with them? A people-centered taxation system You are say, saying the taxation system is blind. The blindedness of the taxation system. I think it's good. We have officials from Zimra, and we are certainly going to get balanced opinions at the end of the day. And when we leave this place, we will be knowledgeable people. And then at this point, uh, the next 20 or so minutes, I would want us to have a discussion which centers on John's presentations around the underlying key principles. Uh, later, after tea break, we are going to have a cutting edge presentations that I think will lay bare 
our subject matter. But before those, we would like to have a, a discussion to understand our, our critical vintage points, where we are standing. You know, there are many views in here. And these views, opinions, were very, very critical. In enlightening us, you know, they say, when I was still at college, that was groups and areas. And then I was saying to myself, uh, in all these things, how do we make sure that uh, we are able to to ensure that these these th three things are done. That national development, for example, in in uh, in Binga, development in Binga is accessible. How do we make sure that uh, uh, the resources that have been collected, and particularly in, in the in the Mark North area, are actually accessed by the, by those people? How do we make sure that those marginalised groups um, actually get access to the things that they they are supposed to get? And and, and, and I was saying to myself, right now is the system stand. It, it would be folly for anyone to say that we don't know that they are marginalized groups. It would also be folly to say that we don't know that uh, there is development that is actually needed in certain areas uh, of the country. But who is there, um, who is going to be there in order to have that oversight role and ensure that all these things are actually uh, uh, meant to come to pass? Should we give the button to, to Parliament and, and, and ensure that Parliament has that oversight role to ensure that uh, uh, development is, is, is seen to be happening in those areas? Or should we make sure that uh, they also have the button in terms of, of, of ensuring that uh, um, uh, the resources are shared equitably? But again, I'm then saying to myself, would it be possible for Parliament to be able to do that, where we, 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 we find a, a particular party having a certain majority and a particular and, and others not having um, enough to influence decisions in Parliament, would it work? So these are the things that are, 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 I'm left with I, I, in my mind. I, I believe probably as we go on with our discussions, uh, most of those things will, will, will probably come up, but uh, I, I'm actually itching to have uh, those issue, issues addressed. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my first issue is about uh, the citizens themselves uh, understanding the public. Uh, uh, 
like this on it with text. Because there are the ones that are supposed are the direct beneficiaries from such. So I think this one is just a comment which I would say is for, for civil society also to realize some gaps in terms of educating the citizens or in terms of the public uh, finance management uh, uh, act. Then uh, from the presentation that we had from John, the, I picked up the issue of, of priorities, misplaced uh, priorities. As one of our biggest enemies in this country, I don't know how far true some of these things are. Maybe parliamentarians as well they can assist us. Where well, you would be able to to charter a plane to go and collect someone for a funeral at a cost of about four million. When you don't have the medicines in hospital, and when your schools are not uh, resourced and other public issues are not uh, resourced, what do we call that? The issue of private. I think John gave a, a simple example of, of dualizing Harare Blower Road, why we have areas which are, are not accessible at all, where people don't even see a car for about two days. I remember someone saying in, in some areas uh, they, they heard about uh, it's a joke, it's not that I support any party. <laughs> someone said uh, the people in, in the deep being us we heard saying, ah, that uh, group was that one guy after about four, four months. Because they have no access to uh, but we are able to take four million and charter a plane to go and collect someone for a funeral. So I think the issue of priorities, and maybe if we can equip the citizens themselves with the provisions of this, whatever laws of public finance, so that they can make a bigger noise when funds are being abused. That's why I also go back to civic society to say, civic society must equip, Let, let's have more programs that unpack this technical of this laws, so that the ordinary citizen who is the direct beneficiary of, the, of, of these public finances is able to, to see that the government is going wrong in such and such. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much, John, for that uh, presentation. My, maybe my contribution is on the quality of our public officials. Uh, when when the, the Arab business government was invited to, to the parliamentary portfolio, he actually raised this issue of saying that our MPs, when they vote for a budget uh, with, with a deficit, where do they think that the money is going to, to come from? Because uh, most of the times, uh, at the end of the day, it is about the quality of the public officials that we are we are electing. Most of them they do not even have a basic appreciation of what of finance. Uh, this is the the really reason why we are having all these uh, problems. They, they, most of them. If 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 we are having a critical in Parliament on public finance and other things, you won't find them. You will find that the the Parliament is empty. We only see them when they are there for their own benefits. We are happy that he, the MPs are here today. Uh, a, at one time, uh, I think it was beginning of this year, some of the MPs were threatening not to vote for the budget because if they did not increase their own benefits. But when it comes to the critical issues which they are supposed to be looking into, you will, you will not see them. You will find that in Parliament there are only 25 MPs there are only 35 MPs out of the 210 MPs. So at the end of the day, it goes back to the quality of the leaders that we are voting for. Because if we are voting for people who are negligent, people who are selfish, who are only uh, worried about their own benefits, at the end of the day, uh, this country is not going to go anywhere. Then there was, uh, at the, recently there was this issue of Zinara, where this company, Univen, which was given a, a tender, to, to do the, the billing at the toll gates, which was 
which is collecting about 20% of the, of the revenue, of the gross revenue, as, as, or as their payment. Then you will, find, you will wonder where were the MPs when these such kind of valuations were, were being done. So I think as long as we are, as a country, we, are, we, we keep on uh, electing people on the basis of our popularity of this party without regard to competence, we are always going to have uh, these problems because we are electing people who do not know what exactly they are going to do there. And again, what is also important maybe uh, without making the thing elitist, what is needed is also to 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 have some maybe some some empowerment which should be done to, to the MPs to make them to the, to the public officials to make them understand their role in terms of uh, public finance. Thank you. Uh, yeah, And certainly, we need to hear a different voice when it comes to these issues. Yes, I was just looking at the presentation, that there are quite a number of uh, expressions that uh, sound very appealing. Transparently, fairly, equitably, prudent, economically efficient, the best interest for Zimbabwe, so Those are very good expressions. And they make the presentation or the intent very clear and uh, and uh, of of good intention. But uh, that does not go full circle in the absence of uh, effectively. There is no way we find effective in this whole uh, presentation that we looked at. Uh, it's about all those other appealing words. But to be effective, there has to be a monitoring systems that would measure performance, that would bring into account or question and, and, and even rectify. In other words, I'm, I'm saying as long as there is no checking mechanism, it remains open to abuse by individuals, by institutions, or by manipulation of some, of some sort. So for it to be a complete uh, presentation, it should talk to checking mechanisms that will em employ monitoring, measuring progress, questioning or bringing into account, and rectifying where things are going wrong. And that ensures effectiveness. You can be e efficient doing the wrong thing. But effectiveness brings the correct results. So let's also include those. Thank you very much. OK. Thank you.
commercial banks and the committee provide a workshop to understand the implications of the new monetary policy and the change in all of those things. Here I sit with five pieces of legislation that surround this very topic. I'm not a lawyer, I'm an accountant. To understand the depth of these documents takes a lawyer, actually. And whilst I can sit in Parliament to end this debate on some of these goals, yes, I may not understand or be able to impact. And I think that I have consistently said, which is what I think, the Constitution is a good document, its words, but without the political will to implement the spirit as well as the word, you, we will continue to have marginalized areas. We will continue to have skewed priorities in terms of the budget. One of the budgetary issues that amazes me nobody else has raised is that the president's office, actually, the portion of the budget that goes to the president's office in the budget is never accounted. It is a, an amount of money which is never disclosed how it is spent. How do we have we tolerated all this time a situation where public funds can be spent but not declared because it goes to the president's office? The gentleman from Zimra is sitting across from me. As an accountant, can I tell you, Zimra is like a war zone. The majority of Zimbabweans struggle actually to understand how they operate when the, when the rules are changed. How are they changed? The monetary policy, if you have to ask him now, can he explain to us exactly what it means to Zimbabwe the change in the monetary policy? Does he really know? Do they have answers? There are so many facets to public fund management, public funds management. And for me, the key thing in the Constitution is section, is chapter 2, section 9, paragraph B, which talks about corruption. You can have 10 pieces of legislation. If we cannot put our foot in Zimbabwe and end corruption at all levels, from the top right down, we will continue to suffer a lot of the problems that we have. In, in a committee meeting yesterday, we discussed about pilferage from public hospitals. And actually, that was the point raised, that the legislation, the systems, don't stop it. If they, the people who want to be corrupt to find new ways to be corrupt. And, and actually, that is a will. That is a will of the people of Zimbabwe and a political will to end corruption. Thank you. Thank you, Honor. I hope I am informed that we are not doing well on time. We are left with less than two hours. Yet we have to get the heroes of this So, for those who are going to be a party, the events, the politics, the election. At this moment, let's go for our team. The cyberspace is home to billions of people and is the right platform you need to grow your business. The Center for Innovation and Technology is offering you a golden opportunity to speak directly to your market at an affordable price. We also offer media training workshops, live streaming, documentary production, and events management. Get in touch with us today on the following numbers. Plus 263-867-711-0290 or 0718-100-235. Don't forget to subscribe to our social media platforms. Like our Facebook page, 
Center for Innovation and Technology. Follow us on Twitter at SiteZW. And you can also check out our website, www.site.org.zw. You can also visit our offices at 45 Moffat Avenue, Hillside, Malawi. Take advantage of...